we go. So, um, so yes, uh, hello everyone. I'm Mark Jackson, and I'm I'm honored to be uh, giving the first presentation here at the Portland Quantum Computing Meetup. So, I work for Cambridge Quantum Computing, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, this presentation here, the race for quantum computing. It's a very general presentation about quantum computing. So it's kind of a general overview of the field and I don't assume any mathematical or technical knowledge. Uh, so if, if you're a complete novice and you're just enthusiastic or curious, that's totally fine. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about the company I work for to begin with. So we're about six years old and we have about a hundred people, uh, which funny enough makes us one of the oldest and largest quantum computing groups in the world now. We really did come out of the University of Cambridge, uh, the, the old Cambridge in England. And so that's, that's actually a, a real picture from where our headquarters is. Uh, we have three other offices in the United Kingdom, one office in Berkeley, California, one office in Washington, DC, and one in Tokyo. And, uh, and we work on both the, uh, uh, all sides of the quantum software, and I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in this presentation, as well as hardware for uh, encryption and cybersecurity. So the birth of computing was actually about 200 years ago, almost exactly. And, uh, and this was Babbage's difference engine, as he called it. So it was sort of a mechanical computational device. And even though it looks very different from what we would call a computer, all of the basic ingredients are there. And in 200 years, of course, we've made enormous progress in what we call a computer. And this is more in line with what most of you would call a computer nowadays. In fact, this is exactly what I'm using to give this presentation right now. Um, just one thing, maybe could I ask you to, uh, to all mute yourselves while I'm giving this and then we can op open it up later for questions. Thanks. So I think, so this is what, uh, uh, here's, hold on one minute. Let me this guy be doing this on Memorial Day. Hi, everyone, let me, Mute everyone, yeah. There we go. So this is, uh, this is, I think, what most of you would call a computer nowadays. And this is actually the exact computer that I'm using to give this presentation on. And even though it looks very different from what the previous slide showed a computer to be, it's actually conceptually identical in 200 years, we haven't made any progress really on how we actually store the information because before we stored information as little switches, which were mechanically done. And in today's modern computer, we store this information as little electronic switches, but it's still really on or off. The basic idea is actually identical. And what I'm going to be telling you about quantum computing is really the first leap forward in how humans process information. So the birth of quantum computing is usually given in 1982 when a Nobel Prize winning physicist named Richard Feynman, he suggested that there were certain problems that normal computers would never be able to solve. And uh, an example of this is something that you have probably heard of called the traveling salesman problem. So this is when you are given some list of cities and you're given the distances between the cities and you're trying to find the shortest path between all of them so that you hit them all. And if you have a small number of cities, it's actually pretty easy to do in your head probably. And if you have a few more, maybe you can't do it in your head, but at least you could do it on a computer. But you notice, based on this chart here, you notice as the number of cities increases, the amount of time that it would take a computer to do it increases unreasonably fast. So going from 10 cities, which only takes a fraction of a second, to 20 cities would take 2,000 years. So it's not just doubling the size of the problem makes it about twice as, as more difficult to solve. It's that much more rapid uh, in computational cost. And so Feynman realized this was a very general problem. It wasn't just, well, we can wait a little while for computers to get better next year. This was a general class of problems. And he said, for reasons I'll get into, nature does computations in a quantum way. And we should build a computer that does it in a quantum way as well. And of course, back in 1982, no one really knew how to do this. It, it sounded wonderful, but no one knew how to actually build a quantum computer at any sort of practical level. And in the past 40 years, we've made a lot of progress. And in fact, just the past year, past few years, this field has really exploded. So to explain what a quantum computer is, 
I, uh, I often like to kind of compare it to a coin. And since I work for a British company, I'm going to use British coins here. Now, let's remind ourselves that normal computers work with bits or binary digits, which are a lot like having a coin on the table. It's either heads or tails. It's one or the other, but it's definitely not both. But a quantum computer works with something called a quantum bit or qubit. And a qubit can actually be heads and tails at the same time. And I'm even going to redo that animation there. And so it's a bit like you have a spinning coin. Until you actually measure it, it's in this kind of funny indeterminate state where it's a little bit of heads and a little bit of tails. But eventually, you might want to measure it. And then we say you collapse it into one or the other. And it's just probabilistic which one it ends up in. So the technical term for being in both at the same time is called superposition. And it's kind of the, the basic idea in quantum physics. Now, just having one qubit means that you can do two things at once. You can consider the one and the zero at the same time. But the real power of quantum computing is that every time you add one qubit, you're doubling the number of configurations that you can have at the same time. So two qubits gives you four things at once. And four qubits gives you 16 configurations at once. 30 qubits gives you a billion at once. And by the time you're at 300 qubits, this actually is equivalent to the number of configurations given by all atoms in the universe. And so that's why people are so excited about quantum computing. It's not just a faster computer. It could do things that we never, ever could have done with a normal computer. And so that's really where the power in quantum computing lies, is that it gets exponentially more powerful as you increase the number of qubits linearly. So how do you actually build one from scratch? So there's actually several ways. And in this slide, I've given uh, some of the, the more popular ones. So the first one is superconducting. And this is an approach used by Google and IBM and half of Intel and a group called Rigetti based in Berkeley. And superconducting technology is based on the idea that some materials, when you get them very, very cold, that they can conduct electricity with almost zero resistance. And we've known about this type of technology for several years. In the past few years, we've been learning how to, to build quantum computers from this. One advantage is that it's very, very fast. And we, we know that it, it works. Uh, IBM and Google have built quantum computers on the order of 50 qubits that work together. And so it really certainly works. One disadvantage is that these qubits are a bit fragile. In order to keep the special quantum properties, they need to, we call this quantum coherence, they need to be kept very, very cold. And, uh, and so that requires a lot of infrastructure, like very effective uh, refrigerators kept near absolute zero. And so this infrastructure, it's kind of bulky and difficult, and it's very expensive. Uh, another approach is the trapped ion approach, in which you use lasers to trap charged particles. And one advantage is that the, uh, the qubits are much more stable. They can last far, far longer than for superconducting. But a disadvantage is that they're very slow. In order to do operations, it takes much, much longer for that to happen. Um, but fortunately, it actually does work at, at basically room temperature. So that's another advantage. A third approach is so-called topological approach, in which we use these special particles called Majorana fermions. They have this amazing property that they remember when you move them around each other. And so it's a bit like with braiding. If, you, if you're braiding hair, even though your hands are moving around, the hair remembers if you've braided it. And so in order to undo that, you have to move your hands all the way around. So it's not really the details of how you move them around or not. What's important is just how many times. And so for qubits, this is a fantastic property because you can cleverly encode the value of the qubit in this braiding with these particles. So the advantage is that it has almost zero error but the disadvantage is that this technology is far behind the others. Uh, so right now, it's actually only Microsoft that is commercially trying to develop this. And, uh, and we haven't, the public has not seen even two qubits working from this approach. Uh, we know that they made enormous progress in this. And so we're looking forward to this announcement. And if they could get it to work and scale, that they really would be the winners. It would really be amazing. Uh, we just haven't seen the technology there yet. And then one, uh, one final one, which I just want to quickly mention, is photonic, in which you're using particles of light, or photons, to do this. And there's, there's at least two startups who are trying to commercially develop this. There's Xanadu quantum computing in Toronto, and there's SciQuantum uh, in Palo Alto. 
so these are some of the groups that I've mentioned. Um, so Google and IBM, I've mentioned, are using superconducting approach as, uh, as is half of Intel. In fact, they have to be based here in Portland. Uh, Microsoft, as I mentioned, is using the topological approach. Uh, Rigetti is also using superconducting. Honeywell and IonQ are both using IonTrap technology. And, uh, and then NKIT is an example of, a, it's actually the, uh, uh, the academic group which came out of Oxford. So we know of over 100 quantum computing groups just in the Western Hemisphere alone. All of these pictures here are actual pictures of quantum computers. These are not artist illustrations. So if, if there's one thing that I would like to communicate, it's that quantum computers really do exist. These, this is not science fiction. It's, it's not just some sort of fantasy. It really does exist and people really are developing quantum programs and have been for the past few years. If you were to ask me who's winning, I would actually not be able to tell you. I would say that it's a bit like asking who's winning a marathon after one mile. The race has certainly begun, but it's difficult to say who, who the winner is because different groups are using different strategies. Some are trying to increase the quantity of the qubits and some are trying to increase the quality of the qubits, trying to decrease the error rate. And, uh, and both of those are important for, for any sort of commercial application. And so, uh, so that's where the status is right now. This is a, a very quick overview of the ecosystem. So I've mentioned IBM and Google and Microsoft are all commercially developing this. They've all developed partnership programs. So they're building the quantum hardware, the actual computer, but they're encouraging developers to write software around those quantum computers. I would say that IBM has the best developed uh, kind of commercial partnerships right now. So there's actually a long list. Uh, this is only a very small sampling of companies which are developing software for IBM. Uh, they've also added a number of big corporations who are interested in using this technology. And IBM has done a great job of matchmaking between these startups uh, developing the software and the corporations who actually want to use it. Um, Google is also developing a partnership program. It's less developed than IBM, but, uh, but they have added, for example, Volkswagen as a corporation who's using it. And then finally, Microsoft, um, they've added a number of developer, de developer partners. As I mentioned, so far, no one has had access to their hardware, but they have provided us with a simulator that we have access to. So we can pretend that we're writing code for their, for their processor. I don't think any presentation about quantum computing would be complete without mentioning the big announcement, uh, which happened last October. So for some time, there had been discussion about a term called quantum supremacy. And this was a, a term coined a few years ago in which you find an example of something that a quantum computer could do that a normal computer couldn't do. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a useful thing. It's just one example of something that a quantum computer could do that a normal computer couldn't. And there, there's been controversy about the term and what it means and is it important and such. But this actually did happen in October. There was a, a technical article published. And so Google did this and this has been confirmed by other people in the field. And so, uh, so this, this really is a great milestone. It's certainly not the end of it. It's just the beginning. So, uh, so this really is a real thing. In terms of the future roadmap for where quantum hardware is going, this is probably the best guess that anyone has. So I've taken this slide from IBM. So they've made this nice chart, which is kind of mimicking Moore's law. So I'm sure many of you know that Moore's law implies the doubling of, of classical computing power every 18 months or so. And so this is kind of mimicking Moore's law. Uh, notice it's, it's plotted on a log chart, the vertical axis. So this straight line of the gray dots and then the blue extrapolation. So this is sort of the quantum Moore's law, um, but it actually is doubling in power every year, not just 18 months. So IBM's trajectory is better than Moore's law. Now Honeywell claims that they can do much, much better than that. In fact, just a few weeks ago, they announced that they will soon be coming out with a quantum processor, which has double the power of IBM's right now. And furthermore, they claim that they can increase this by a factor of 10 every year. And so that means that in five years, in 2025, it should have a factor increase of 100,000. So even if they don't quite get that, if they're anywhere close to having that, that would really be amazing. And this pink line illustrates the trajectory that that would put us on. And so that's why people are so excited. It's not just uh, on, a, on a good trajectory anyway, 
the past month especially has implied that commercial applications may be much closer than we thought. So this is kind of a quick overview of, of the quantum field of quantum computing and related fields like, uh, like quantum communication and simulations and such. And I could spend a long, long time talking about these different aspects. I'm just gonna briefly touch upon a few of these today uh, to whet your appetite. So I think three of the industries which, which will be most transformed by quantum computing will be chemistry, machine learning, and encryption and communication. And so I'd like to just briefly say a few words about each of these. So quantum chemistry was actually the very first thing that was realized that uh, the quantum computers would be good at. And, uh, and this was actually the, the real example that Richard Feynman had in mind because what he understood was when you're trying to do chemistry, what you're trying to really do is you're trying to understand how the electrons rearrange themselves around the molecule. And so the, the picture is sort of like here on the left, you have the backbone of the nuclei, but the electrons are moving around and they make some sort of cloud-like pattern. And we know exactly what the equations are. We've known for a hundred years. So that's not the tough part. The tough part is that every electron is interacting with every other, uh, every other electron. And as the molecule gets bigger, we get more and more atoms and more and more electrons. And so the number of equations quickly gets out of control for a normal computer to solve them. Now we can do it for a small molecule like the one I show here on the left, but for any sort of interesting molecules, like for biology and medicine and such, it's, it's completely beyond the capabilities of any computer. And again, it's not just a matter of, well, computers get better every year, we just wait a little while. The scaling of how difficult it becomes is far beyond what a normal computer could do. And this is really what Richard Feynman had in mind when he was thinking about quantum computing, because the equations that need to be solved are quantum. And so he said, we should come up with a quantum computer to do this. Now, what's so important about chemistry that we would, we would need to invent a quantum computer to do this? So the first reason is because of fertilizer. About 2% of the world's energy supply goes into making fertilizer. And it's a very inefficient process. It really hasn't changed in about 150 years. We know that bacteria are much better at doing this than we are. We just don't know how they do it. So the hope is that if we were better at chemistry, maybe we could come up with a more energy efficient way to build fertilizer. Uh, a second application is more energy efficient materials like batteries and solar panels. And then a third application is in personalized medicine. And this, this uh, is very exciting. And I'm sure many of you see that it has a lot of relevance to some of the current events today. Now, let's think for a second how medicine is done right now. Pharmaceutical companies, when they develop a drug, they're really developing one drug to treat everyone. And they do the best they can, but they basically have to use guess and check to do this. And this is why it takes so long and it's so expensive. They have to just kind of make a guess at what the drug would be, and then they test it on people. And for some people, it might be very effective. For some people, it may have almost no effect. And for some people, it may actually be harmful, but they just do the best they can. And so it takes a long time and it's expensive and it's risky. Imagine how much better it would be if we could design a drug for an individual based on their genetic makeup. So it would be a drug just for them to treat their condition, but minimize the side effects. And so that is really the goal of, uh, of personalized medicine, to design drugs for individuals. And to do that, you would really have to understand chemistry very, very well. And there's no way that we can do that with a normal computer. The dream is that we could use quantum computers to do that. Now, an example of being able to do that is with molecular docking. And so this is when you're trying to understand how one molecule, a shorter one, fits into a larger one called the target. And so this is kind of a simple schematic here, but this is a video that I found online. So this is what is being done right now with normal computers to try to understand how to design drugs. But the attempts are very limited. There's only so much that you can do. And so this is a short animation of a computer trying to understand how effective a drug is. So the big background one there is the target, and it's trying to make the best guesses of how this drug would interact with the target molecule. So it tries all the different combinations and it assigns them a score and it goes through all the different possibilities and in the end, it just selects the one with the best score. So of course this takes a lot of time. It would be much, much more efficient if we could do this on a quantum computer. And this is already starting to be done. This is a, a flow chart here showing how it could be done. And you notice that it uses both a classical computer and a quantum computer. So it's a bit like having a CPU and a GPU where 
the code gets handed off to the CPU or GPU as appropriate, they each do their instructions, and then the results are synthesized at the end, and the result is given. And so people are already starting to develop this sort of uh, quantum chemistry for personalized medicine approach using a hybrid quantum classical approach. So that's a, a very quick overview of chemistry. The next topic I wanted to mention is quantum machine learning. And these, these kind of combine two of the big ideas, uh, AI and machine learning and quantum computing. But what does it really mean to have quantum machine learning? So let's remind ourselves that classical machine learning is probability-based. So all of the things that you've learned about machine learning are really based on this idea of using past data to come up with probabilities for what the future answers will be. And probabilities are actually pretty simple because they're just numbers between zero and one. Whereas quantum computers work with something called an amplitude or a vector. And, uh, and if you're not mathematical, you can think of it just as an arrow. And the important thing about arrows is that they have a direction. And when you add them together, it's important that they have this relative angle between them. So if the arrows are roughly in this, going in the same direction, when you add the head of one to the tail of the other, you notice that you get a longer arrow here. But if the two arrows are kind of in opposite directions, they cancel each other out. And so you can see right away that the mathematics of this is much more sophisticated than just probabilities, which are simply numbers and they have no direction. And so this is why people are excited about quantum machine learning, because this more advanced mathematics of, use, of using amplitudes and vectors, it should be able to identify patterns that never would have been seen by classical computers, classical machine learning. And so people are already starting to apply some of these quantum machine learning tools to different problems. So many of them are financial. Uh, obviously, a lot of financial institutions are interested in using this uh, to kind of make predictions about the stock market or other items, uh, portfolio optimization, and, uh, and machine learning. And to be a little bit more specific, when you're making simulations about what the stock market or, or what have you is doing, a very useful tool is something called Monte Carlo analysis, where you're using kind of statistics and probability to do this. Uh, so it turns out that there has already been a quantum Monte Carlo version developed. And theoretically, it is quadratically faster than the classical version. And so it, people are investigating right now whether this actually translates to an increase in speed in the real world. Because sometimes mathematically, you might see that it's faster. But then when you try to implement it, there's some sort of bottleneck that you wouldn't have seen theoretically. And so this is very much under investigation right now. Um, a lot of financial institutions have already started projects trying to apply a quantum Monte Carlo approach to their, uh, their stock trading strategies. Uh, another thing, as I mentioned, is uh, portfolio optimization. And so you're, you have some sort of risk that you're trying to minimize, and you have a lot of different factors that you want to include in this. It's actually believed that the quantum algorithm is exponentially faster than the classical approaches. And so again, a lot of financial companies are already starting to investigate this about whether this translates into an increase in speed in the real world. And then finally, there's something called adversarial machine learning. And so, uh, and so this is a much larger topic, but, uh, but you can kind of make machine learning routines battle each other so that they both get smarter. The final topic that I wanted to mention is encryption. And I think if, if there's one thing that you might have seen in, in newspaper headlines, it's that quantum computing is responsible for hacking and such. And so this is what I want to quickly address here. So to remind ourselves of how encryption works, when you have some sort of sensitive information, the reason that you can usually safely communicate that is because you don't send that sensitive information itself. You, what, you encrypt it using some sort of complicated formula and you communicate the encrypted version of that. And then the person on the other end needs to use some sort of key to decrypt it. And we purposely use mathematical formulas, which are so complicated that no one without the key should be able to undo it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's impossible to do. It's usually just very, very difficult. And it is theoretically possible if someone had a very powerful computer and a very long time to use that computer that they could do it. But it's usually such that you would need such a powerful computer for so long, that would cost more money than whatever this information is worth. And so that's why most of the time encryption works pretty well. But the situation has changed a lot because the formulas that we've been using for 40 years happen to be formulas that quantum computers are very good at undoing. 
And this was realized a few years ago, about 25 years ago, actually, by this very smart professor at MIT named Peter Shore. And at the time, it was academically interesting that quantum computers didn't exist yet. And so no one took this as a serious threat. But now that qu quantum computers exist and are developing so rapidly, people are very concerned about this. So to see exactly how this works, the simplest example is what's called RSA type of encryption. And, uh, and this is one of the main types of encryption that's actually used on the internet. And it's based on this idea that it's easy to multiply numbers together, but it's difficult to, to go the other way. If you're given the large number, it's very difficult to factor them into the prime numbers. So it's sort of a mathematical one-way door. And it turns out this is something that quantum computers are very good at. This is what Peter Shor realized 25 years ago. And RSA and other types of encryption, which a quantum computer could defeat, is actually responsible for 99% of online encryption. So 99% of encryption right now is vulnerable to hacking from quantum computers at some point. Now, quantum computers couldn't do it today, but in five to 10 years, it's possible. And people have different views about what the timeline is, but most people agree that in a few years, it could be possible. So that's kind of the scary news. The good news is that people haven't been asleep. Uh, so mathematicians and computer scientists have already started developing encryption formulas based on different mathematical formulas that quantum computers are not believed to be good at. And so there's actually a contest right now uh, by NIST. There's a list of 26 so-called post-quantum encryption algorithms that are being developed. And so this is, as I said, a contest going on right now by this government agency, NIST, people are doing their best to attack them so that we can see which ones are, uh, are sturdy before we actually use them in practice. Even after a winner is selected, within a few years probably, that doesn't mean that magically the next day everything is fine. It takes a lot of time to upgrade systems. If you've ever just tried to upgrade your own computer, you know how difficult that can be. But imagine trying to do that for the entire government or your entire corporation. There's a lot of baggage and history in the software being used. And so it, it will probably take several years to fully upgrade your computer infrastructure. And so this is why most people are being encouraged, are being encouraged to start upgrading right now, ahead of time. And to add a little more urgency to this, this is an article from the Washington Post just a few months ago. And it highlights what's being characterized as sort of an arms race between China and, and the Western parties, including the US, China is very aggressively going into, uh, into quantum technologies, particularly quantum communications. And so, uh, so it, it really is a very important topic. Now, there's a related technology, which isn't precisely quantum computing, but it's very closely aligned with this, called quantum key distribution. And it uses quantum technologies to produce unhackable communication. So this is a, a video produced by this group in Singapore of how that's done. So you have a source of entangled particles. Now entanglement means you have two particles which are in the same quantum state. You don't know what it is, it's random, but they're random together. So it produces these entangled particles and these are independently measured by two detectors. We'll call them Alice and Bob. So Alice and Bob measure along random directions and then they compare. If they measured in the same direction, they should always get the same answer 100% of the time because of the entanglement. So once they do that, they can verify that the communication was secure. They got the same answer every single time they measured in the same direction. But now we do this in which there's some sort of eavesdropper, we'll call her Eve, which is intercepting these particles. So Eve is grabbing one of the particles, measuring it, and then replacing it in that same state. So according to classical physics, that's the perfect crime because it's been replaced and it would be impossible to tell. But because this was a quantum system, the entanglement has been broken. And so now when Alice and Bob do their measurements, and again, they're measuring in, in independently random directions, when they do their comparison at the end, even if they measured in the same direction, they don't always get the same answer some large fraction of the time, they will disagree about what the answer was. And so that way, Alice and Bob know that there was some sort of tampering or eavesdropping, and they can shut down that communication channel and start a new one. And so this is uh, 
This is really amazing because it means that quantum physics can protect your communication. It's not just a complicated formula. It's actually something based on fundamental physics that does this. So the final thing that I'd like to mention is, uh, is quantum compilers. And just like any normal computer software, you of course need a compiler to take the code that you wrote and turn it into instructions for the machine. Now, Cambridge Quantum has developed a compiler called Ticket, which is actually hardware agnostic. So our compiler works on all of the different machines that I've listed here. Um, you simply change one line in the compiler in your code, and then you select it to run on that. And it also, at the same time, it finds the most efficient way to run it on that machine. And this is especially important nowadays because we don't have that many qubits and we don't have such a, a low error rate. And so you want to make your code as efficient as possible. Uh, this is kind of a mathematical explanation of how that goes about. So on the lower left side, this is an, an example of a quantum circuit. So this is actually how you program a quantum computer. This is the shorthand used to do it. And then above that is kind of how you would write that as a computer code. And this is deconstructed by our compiler to kind of understand how these different instructions relate to each other. And it's then reassembled in the most efficient way possible. And this compiler is, is free and available to the public. Um, if you actually um, uh, just send me a note and I'll send you the GitHub repo link. Um, so we would love for you to use it and we would love your feedback. Um, again, it's free and uh, open to the public. So to briefly conclude, uh, quantum computers really do exist right now. And I think commercial applications are at most five years away. And I think especially based on Honeywell's recent announcement, it could be much sooner than that. I think within 10 years, uh, we will see quantum computers fully integrated into our technological in infrastructure. Uh, in terms of, of encryption security, there are already post-quantum encryption algorithms being developed, um, but I would encourage you to upgrade now because hacking is possible and even likely in five to 10 years, but I wouldn't wait that long. I would encourage you to upgrade right now. And so that is it for the prepared section, um, but I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that you might have. So um, let me go to the chat line here. Oh, okay, so here's a Here's a question from uh, Ethan Siegel. Hey Mark, if a nefarious eavesdropper, Eve, knows what your acceptable error rate is and eavesdrops below that threshold, is there any way Alice and Bob can detect that eavesdropping? Is this a security threat if Eve gets only 1% or 0.1% of the data? Uh, this is an excellent point. And so when I said that, that Alice and Bob should agree 100% of the time, that's, that's a little bit of a lie. It, theoretically, they would agree 100% of the time. But in the real world, of course, nothing is perfect. And so just from like expansion of the fiber optic cable or something, uh, it's not going to be precisely 100%. It's going to be like 99.999% or something like that. And so it is always possible that Eve could eavesdrop a little bit and kind of look like, like some sort of uh, physical artifact like that. Um, but of course, this means she only gets like a very small fraction of the data. And so what usually happens is that when Alice and Bob, uh, when they exchange their key, they do some sort of purification. So they, they agree, as long as it's like 99.9% .9 or above or something, and then they hash the key into something else. And so, uh, so yeah, these, these subtleties in the real world do come up. Um, from Matt, can you speak towards the types of mathematical research taking place behind the development of quantum programming languages? What are some of the problems in the space and area of math is used to solve them. So I actually know very little about um, the more mathematical aspects of this. Uh, obviously, in quantum physics, uh, linear algebra is obviously very important. That's kind of what you're programming in. Um, you need to understand, uh, so qubits are mathematically, they're called SU2 or a spin one half system. And so you need to understand the mathematics of, of how that works. Um, but I, I think actually in about one month, Jennifer might be talking about some of the more mathematical aspects of programming. And so, uh, so I'll just defer to her about that. Um, and yes, I will post the GitHub repo for everyone. Um, Q 
can you provide some insight regarding machine learning AI and potential existential threats to global security? Is this something to be concerned about? It is something to be thinking about, yes. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of people are characterizing it as some sort of new arms race um, between, for example, China and the Western parties. It's, uh, it's a lot like that. It's not like with normal computers because almost everyone, almost everyone has a computer and has access to the internet. So it's very democratic. Um, some people abuse that, but it's still democratic. Whereas with quantum computing, you notice that the people developing them tend to be big corporations like IBM, Google, Microsoft, and such, or at least startups with $100 million. And so not everyone will have access to a quantum computer and pretty serious damage could be done once they're powerful enough. So, so it's not as democratic as we would think. Um, yes, are there any other questions? The time dependence of the Schrodinger equation, a problem with qubits, if the Schrodinger equation changes states over time, or are qubits measuring something else right now? Uh, yes, so the time dependence is governed by the Schrodinger equation, exactly as you would expect. I have a question, if I can say yeah. it instead of type yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I was surprised to hear an estimate of five years towards to, to commercial applications, what you expect. The, the estimates that I had heard not being an expert in that side of things were more on the side of 10 to 20 years based on the need for error correction and things like that. So do you, do you have any, um, any like additional insight into why you think that that's likely? Um, so I can say, yes, with, with error correction and everything like that, if we need, uh, like 100,000 qubits with error correction and such, it, it will probably be 10 years away. We're very, we're trying very hard to look for NISCI commercial applications. So things that could be done with a few qubits um, and just accepting that there is an error. Um, so, oh, so NISC um, is the term noisy intermediate scale quantum. And it's a, it's a term coined by John Preskill, uh, a professor at Caltech who also coined the term quantum supremacy. And so, so NISC describes what we have right now. We have 50 to 100 ish qubits, and they, they have an error rate, um, which isn't bad, but it's not great. And so, we just the philosophy is that we just accept that, and we know that the programs can't be that large and, uh, and they can't run for that long. And so, we just run them many, many times, and we hope that most of the time it works correctly. So, we're trying very hard to look for commercial applications which run under those parameters. Um, there are some simple machine learning things that we think we could do, which would still be useful. Um, and especially with Honeywell's announcement, so their error rate is, is about a factor of 100 better than the superconducting ones. And if, 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 any, if it turns out that they're even remotely correct with this improvement of a factor of 100,000 uh, within five years, that really would change everything. And there really would be commercial applications. So that's why we're hopeful that, that it would be on that time scale. Can you explain what quantum volume is and how it's different from measuring qubits? That, that's a very good question. So, so as I mentioned, the, each qubit doubles the number of configurations that you can have at once. But if you have a qubit with a large error rate, that doesn't do you any good because you're just going to get the wrong answer most of the time. And so, so just looking at the qubits, the qubit count itself is not a very useful metric. And so IBM came up with this term quantum volume. And it's not simple to describe. It's actually kind of a complicated formula, but it basically, it takes into account the error rate and how many, how many operations you can do and how long it will last and how many qubits you can use effectively. And so to increase the quantum volume, you need to have an increase, not just in the number of qubits, but also the quality, the, the inverse error rate. And so, so the record right now is 32. So IBM has a 32 quantum volume processor. Uh, Honeywell claims that they will soon, in the next few weeks, come out with a 64 quantum volume processor. And then, as I said, um, increase that by a factor of 10 every year. Um, are there any other hey, questions? 
Oh, hi, Ben. This is Ben. Hey, how's it going? Um, I had a question. Do you know, I haven't actually seen if Honeywell is actually, are they going to be commercializing that API? Um, is that when? Who, who is that? Is the well, I was wondering if the expectation is that um, Honeywell is going to be commercializing that API, an API with a support on volume um, device in the near future. I see. Um, I don't think so. Um, so IBM has made theirs publicly available. Uh, so if you right now, if you Google IBM Quantum Experience, you can log into their, you create an account, you log in, and you can have access to their five and 16 qubit machines for free. There's a, a queue, but you can get in for free. Uh, if you want to use their 20 or 50 qubit machines, you have to be one of their developer partners or be a corporation and pay quite a bit, like on the order of a million dollars a year. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's it for IBM. Um, I don't think Honeywell has any plans to open it to the public, at least none that I'm aware of. Uh, Honeywell is an investor of the company I work for, and so I think right now we're the only ones with access to it. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of anyone else. Cool, thanks. Oh, um, I heard there's a difference between the types of quantum computers developed by D-Wave versus Google IBM. Is this true? Yes, uh, this, this is a very good point. So D-Wave was the first company to claim that they had a, a quantum computer for commercial use. And this was about 15 to 20 years ago. And they used a technology called quantum annealing or simulated annealing. And it's when you have things which they call qubits and you, you encode the problem that you're studying in the interactions between the qubits. And then what happens is, is you ask it to find the lowest energy configuration and the qubits align themselves into that lowest energy configuration. And the answer to that is the answer to your problem. I sometimes joke it's a bit like a Ouija board where you set up the problem and you ask the question and then it sort of finds the answer. It, it is certainly a computer and it's, it's a very specialized processor. It's sort of like a GPU. It does it much, much faster than a normal computer could solve it. There's been a lot of controversy about whether it's really a quantum computer though. And as time has gone by, it looks like it's not really a quantum computer. You don't get to control the qubits individually. It's only collectively that it's, it finds a solution to this problem. And so that's why um, the, the, this is very different from the approach used by Google and IBM and such. Um, in fact, er, all of the groups that I've talked about today, even though they're using different technology, you can still control the qubits individually. You can still apply individual transformations called gates to each qubit. And so that's why we can write programs to do that. And so, um, so yeah, so it's a very different approach. Um, to combat error, can't you compare the results of three or four qubits? Okay, so this is a, this is a really, really good question. Um, so first, how does error correction work with a normal computer? Computer, yes, you can have three bits. So you just say, if, if you have information in one bit, you just triplicate it. And then if something happens to one of them, you say, okay, well, I'm gonna use the majority. So that way, if something goes wrong with one, the other two will give you the correct answer. The reason that that doesn't work with a quantum computer, the reason that you can't use three qubits to represent one qubit is because in quantum physics, there's this thing called the no cloning theorem. You can't just simply take the information one qubit and triplicate it or, or duplicate it or anything. You can move that information around, but you can't simply copy it. And, uh, and the second reason is that once you measure something, you've destroyed the quantum state. You're collapsing its wave function, we say. And so with a, with a qubit, there'd be no way to know really even what you're copying um, to do that. And so that's why you can't naively do that. However, that same Professor Shore actually did figure out a very clever way of doing it. And the way that he figured it out was you don't actually copy the information from that qubit itself. What you do is you add a few auxiliary qubits and you have this very clever system in which, in which those qubits interact together. And so if an error happens, it kind of uncorrects itself at the end. So there is a way of doing it, but it's, it's not nearly as simple as with a normal computer. Um, the other difference with a, with a quantum computer is that it's not just flipping a one to a zero or vice versa. There's something called a quantum phase. 
Um, so it's, it's kind of the, the relative angle between it. And this is a purely quantum effect. And so you have this whole new set of errors which might pop in, which are more subtle. And so there are ways of correcting these two types of errors, the so-called bit flip and the phase flip errors. Um, you, you need a factor of five to, five to nine times as many qubits to do this error correction, um, of course. And then once you're adding all these extra qubits in, then it makes it much more likely that one of them could find an error. And so then you need to do it again and again and again. And so kind of the general idea is that you would need like two levels of error correction to do this right. And you would need the error rate to be sufficiently low such that having all that error correction doesn't make it worse. So, so you can do it, but it's very subtle with a quantum computer. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining on this, this first time. Um, again, our next one will be in two weeks uh, with Ben talking about quantum chemistry. Uh, I did record this, and so I'll post this on YouTube for later viewing. And I think for the next few, for the next few meetings, this will have to be online. Hopefully at some point, we'll all be able to meet somewhere. And uh, I look forward to meeting you then. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>